Now, today we come to our text in Genesis. Uh, we're looking at the flood account, which is from Genesis chapter 6, verse 9 through 8.22. It's a whole lot of text, and uh, uh, it's going to be fine. We're going to get through it. It's going to be good, all right? So here's what I want to do. I don't want to read all of it up front. I do want to read Hebrews 11, verse 7, and then I will pray, and then we're going to dive in together on the flood narrative. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, this is what the author of Hebrews says about this account. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Let's pray together. Father, oh how good it is to bow in this room together, many of which in this room are your children, children of the Most High God. We sit in Christ, saved and forgiven, and we praise you for that. Lord, others in this room may have some sort of testimony from a long time ago where they said some words and were dunked in some water, but as they examine their life, largely things haven't changed. They might profess to be something, but their life doesn't align with what that something should look like. And yet others, Lord, here may not know you at all. Maybe have wandered in here or come in here seeking to know more about Jesus. God, would you do your work in our hearts today? Would you hide me behind your word as we look into the truth of what's to come? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, uh, if, you've, if you've ever had one of those conversations with someone who, who brought news to you and they said, do you want the good news or the bad news? I got both. I got good news and bad news. Which one do you want first? Uh, are, who, who are the good news first people? Who are the bad news first people? All right, okay. All right, good. Now, today we come to a text that has so much stinking good news. Like, so much incredible good news is in this text today. But the good news is, is it really comes at, as a result of incredible bad news. Just incredible bad news. If you were a kid growing up hearing Noah's Ark, if you were raised in church, you probably heard that famous song, Noah's Ark. The Lord told Noah there's going to be a floody, floody. floody. Okay, maybe I'm the only one <laughs> who heard that song. Okay, that worked out well. The, he, it goes on, there's going to be a floody, floody. And then he goes and says, the Lord told Noah, so build me an arky, arky. Okay, if we're getting there. It ends with rise and shine and give God the glory and glory. All right, cool. Anyway, <laughs> when we're kids in church, we play with all these little Noah's Ark toys. We, we play with little animals. We put them in a boat. Maybe all these little toys in church. Or you, you had the flannel graphs in the Sunday school classrooms that told the story of Noah's Ark in this sort of cute kind of way. But when we approach this story and Noah's Ark, there's always these sort of questions that come about like, oh, what really happened? Was it real? Was it figurative? Or was it a real account? Or what about the dinosaurs? And we come with all these sort of like questions and curiosity. But what we often do with this story is overlook the sheer horror of this story. We overlook the sheer horror of this moment. Just think about the death and the devastation that takes place in the story of Noah and the ark. This is Hurricane Katrina or Hurricane Harvey times, you know, 200 million over the whole earth. God intends, I'm mean, just thinking of this, that the, the story of Noah's ark is about God bringing a worldwide flood to drown every human being and every animal that ever existed except for Noah and his family 
and two sets of everything else. It is an awful story to think about. See, God intends for this story to make us look back at what God did to judge the world because of sin so that we might look forward to know what is to come into the future. And so today's story is going to have some bad news. And it's going to have a lot of good news. This bo- the story is both historical and prophecy. As a New Testament church, we do look back to see what God has done, but also we look ahead in anticipation at what God will do at the end of days. And we often forget about this. We often don't live like this, but there is a judgment to come. There is a real judgment to come on the sinful, on the wicked, on the rebellious. But there is an escape to be made in Christ. That's John 3.16, as Pastor Chris read earlier. And this is the truth that we must believe, that we must know, that we must hold dear to, and we must live by. We must not be distracted by the world because the final days, Matthew tells us, sorry, Jesus tells us in Matthew, the final days will be just like the days of Noah. We're going to talk about that. So here's the question I want to pose for us on this beautiful Lord's Day morning. Are you ready for judgment? Welcome to church. Man, I want to be honest, Denver. I want to be honest, friends and family. I tried really hard to not preach this text here. But by the providence of the Lord, here I am. Asking this question of each one of us, are you personally ready for judgment? Now, we don't like to talk about God's judgment in our culture. I played golf this week with Andy Collins. Anybody know Andy Collins? He's, he's one of your greeters out front. We, we played golf on uh, Thursday morning, and he was much better than I. But anyway, we played golf, and I was talking about the sermon with him. And, uh, and he said, you know what? In America, we don't like to talk about God's judgment. We like to sanitize God's judgment. And I was like, ooh, that's a good word, Andy. We like to keep it clean. We don't like to bring it up. We don't like to look into its reality. Truthfully, we all want the the we we all really want judgment on all kinds of injustices, don't we? Like we want judgment on things like rape or abuse or murder. Like we want judges to be fair and judge them rightly, but we don't like our sin. We don't we don't typically see our sin in that, as that sin that's worthy of judgment. But in God's eyes, sin is sin and rebellion is rebellion. We want God to set things right, but it also means holding us accountable too. For our greed, for our lust, for our gossip, for our actions and thoughts and words and lies. The truth is we all are deserving of judgment. Those who think the final judgment is, is laughable and won't happen, they don't really believe that at all because, because they just want to ignore it. But deep down, inside of each one of them, they do believe it. They do want it. We all get outraged at injustice regularly, when things are unfair, when right now, when people are canceled for something they said or didn't say, we're like, that's not fair. When people are whatever, that's not fair. We do get frustrated at injustice. If the school shooter got the same fate as kids who do dumb things, is that right? No. We want justice. Our desire for justice is programmed in, but the problem is we are not exempt. And so today's story explains how we can be ready for God's judgment. Because God God is the judge, and He is holy, and He is righteous, as we've seen through the book of Genesis. And all of us will one day stand before Him to give an account for our lives. We remind ourselves of where we've been. We saw creation happen, and the fall took place, and we saw God curse sin and death. 
we saw the promise of Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent are going to strive against each other. And he's going to bite his heel, but the serpent's gonna, I mean, the, the, uh, the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. It's a picture of Jesus to come. And then things get worse and worse in Genesis 4. Brother kills brother, so the first man dies. The curse is so strong. Then you get to Genesis chapter 6, through uh, 5 through 6, which, which we talked about last week, which was a very in- interesting text. But we saw widespread wickedness, the broken world, and so God says, I'm going to blot out man. I'm going to wash them all away. God hits the reset button and decides to uncreate his creation. This is what's taking place. Everything that was created was very good, has now become very bad, and he's going to uncreate it all. He's going to wipe away the animals and the plants, and he's going to, the ground that's been cursed, he's going to dr- drown. And so today, I want us to see three ways that we can be ready for God's coming judgment. Three ways that we can be ready for God's coming judgment. Number one, we can believe there is a judgment to come. Now what I mean is, we can believe. When I say believe, I mean really believe. I mean truly believe. I mean believe like Noah believed. So we're going to dive in. We're going to look first at chapter 6, verse 9 through 7, 5. And we're going to see two things Noah did. That's what it says. In verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, a blameless man in his generation. Noah walked with God. Three things we see. He was righteous, he was blameless, and he walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then we go to verse 11. Now the earth was, think about this compared to Noah, the earth was corrupt in God's sight. And the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. So God is pounding away at man's sinfulness here. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, notice what God says, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself in an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its length 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above. And set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which there is breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Notice the reality here. He he highlights Noah's righteousness as a blameless guy amidst man's sinfulness as corruption. And he says, I'm going to come and destroy the earth. Now think about this time here. We might think of all the people in that world as all murderers or all rapists or all the worst of the worst. But in that time, that's not who all the earth was. They were everyday ordinary people like you and I. There were good people there, according to our culture, people like our friends and family, people who were just, you know, farmers and sheep herders and animal tenders. There were people who were getting married and having babies. They were people who were building communities and doing normal things and eating dinners around tables. They were normal everyday people, but inside of their heart was wickedness. Inside of their heart was brokenness. Inside of their heart were selfishness. It's not just the murder and thieves here. It's everyday people. The the point is, and really the last few weeks, what we've been seeing, as Pastor Chris has told us, that we're all deeply sinful in our hearts. We're all deeply broken. It's that which comes from within that causes us to be wicked, not our own flesh. Although we live in broken bodies that desire it, our hearts are broken. And this is the thing that's being highlighted over and over again. Man's wickedness is going to be judged because of their actions, because of their sinfulness. But one finds favor, the one who is righteous, blameless, and walks with God, the man Noah. And so God brings along a promise to Noah. He enters into this covenant with Noah in verse 18. He says, 
But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you, eight people. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come unto you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It also serve, uh, it shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Here's what I want to highlight here. Noah believed God by faith. Noah believed God by faith. Noah did what God told him to do. It's really important that we notice this, that he does what God tells him to do. He steps in faith, and he's found righteous in God's eyes. The second thing we see is that God, that Noah follows God in obedience. So he believed God by faith, and his faith is evidenced by his obedience. Obedience to God is a and it's evidence of a person's faith. When we say, I have believed in Jesus Christ, his word is important to me, and I'm going to walk according to it, is evidence that we really believe the gospel that we say we believe. We really believe the Jesus that we worship. We really believe what God's word says for us. And Noah followed in obedience. We see this in verse 7 through 5. So Noah spends this next, you know, God asks Noah to build an ark. Think about this. God asked Noah to build an ark, and Noah does it. Do you know how long it took him to build the ark before the flood came? A century. Like a whole century, like a hundred years. Noah spent a hundred years in the face of a world who'd never seen rain. A world that probably looked at him and was like, you're a moron. Like, what are you thinking here? Think about all the faith this would have would have taken. It, it may not have seemed reasonable to stop everything to begin a construction project, but Noah picked up a hammer and got to work in faith. How much faith and how much obedience to God does that take? With people walking by you, and I can imagine the ridicule that Noah received from the world, I can imagine the amount of mocking that he received from people going, hey Noah, you're a moron, or hey Shem, what the heck is your dad doing? Hey, hey, Japheth, number one, what's up with your name? Number two, what is, what's your crazy dad doing? That boat is three and a half sizes of a football field. I don't know if they had football back then, but that's how big it was. And Noah spends a hundred years building a boat because he said, listen, judgment is coming. God's bringing judgment on the sin of this world. And you've got to turn from your ways and believe God. Believe Him. Believe Him. Think about this. That Noah believed God so much that in the face of a world that reviled him, he went forward in faith. He went forward in faith. Think about this. You get to verse 1 in chapter 7. There's been a time gap. The flood's about to come. And verse 1 says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Remember, no rain yet. <laughs> There's no rain yet. And God says, get in the boat. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens, also male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, Forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made, I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all the Lord had commanded him. Noah Lord did all that the Lord commanded him. Rain is coming. Noah obeys. Now, Noah's not sinless. Noah is faithful. He is faithful to God. His faith in God, his belief in God, is evidenced by his obedience to God. And God's grace covers Noah's sinfulness. This is why he's righteous, because God gives Noah unmerited favor, and he was faithful to build it and faithful to do all that God commanded him to do. 
Even when there's animals lining up outside, right? And he's telling Shem, Ham, and Japheth to, to get off the, the bears. You know, it's like, hey, leave the monkeys alone, okay? Guys, leave them alone. We've got to get in the boat. Dad, are you sure about this? Yes, son. Judgment is coming. The question is, do you really believe? Do we, as 21st century Americans, with all the distractions we have and all the money and all the resources and Lake Norman and all of our safe, comfortable suburbs, do we really believe judgment is coming? And that good friends and family members may be swept away in God's judgment? This leads us to number two. We should warn others about the judgment to come. We should warn others about the judgment to come. We see in, starting with verse 7, the flood actually comes. Or we'll start with verse 6. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood of clean animals and of animals that are not seen and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground. Two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. And then the rest of the story is all about the flood coming and the flood washing over everything. The waters increase and they bear up over everything. And in verse 23 or verse 21, it says, In all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Verse 22, everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 day, days. God's judgment fell on man's sinfulness. We cannot run from this, Christians. We cannot avoid this reality. We cannot be empathetic. We, we cannot be, I'm sorry, not empathetic. We need to be empathetic. We can't be apathetic about this truth. God's judgment is coming again upon man's sinfulness. Jesus Christ, the one we believe, the one we worship, the one we've been baptized into, the one who has given us life and forgiven of us our sins, the one who's called us his ambassadors, he is coming again to reign. On earth, and at that moment, he will judge the wicked. Do we believe that? Do our lives believe that? Do our words believe that? Do the things we're looking at believe that? Do the words coming out of our mouth and the judgments on these kinds of people or the gossips, are, are our voices testifying to this truth? So when I talk about warning others about the judgment to come, we don't see it clearly in Genesis, but what 2 Peter tells us, what Peter tells us in verse 5, chapter 2, verse 5, says, He did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the wor world of the ungodly. Notice that he calls Moses a herald of righteousness. As Noah is building a boat, he is heralding, heralding the reality that God is the creator and that he is going to judge man's sinfulness. And he's telling them, repent, repent of your sin, turn from your ways, come and worship God, come and walk with God, come and let your lives be aligned to him. You might say, morons, right, about these people, why wouldn't they... Why wouldn't they believe Noah? They, they, if I was there, I would have gotten in the boat. Right? This is what we would say. But would we? Would we say that? Jesus says in Matthew 24, For as, as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the man, Son of Man. For as in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. 
If that sky tore open this afternoon and Jesus came descending, how much would your life immediately change? How quickly would you call your friend or your family member? How quickly would you run to your neighbor's house and would you tell them, it's almost too late. Judgment is coming. You must believe. Or how fast would you go and confess your sin to someone? I've been trapped in this sin. I, I, I don't want to get caught in it. I need to turn from it. I want to live in, I want to live in holiness. I want to live in purity. I want to be known as someone who's been living in the light, not hidden in the darkness. How much would your life immediately change? See, we believe that one day God's judgment is going to fall on us like it did them because we too are sinners. And Genesis 8.21 tells us that the status of humanity hasn't changed. Genesis 8.21 says, I will never again, this is God, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. So God's judgment is coming against man's sinfulness, but there is an escape. And that's the good news. Like, there is an escape through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, can we have hope? Can we have forgiveness for our sin? Can we be made righteous? Can we have eternal life? Jesus is the ark pictured in this story. Noah, by faith, steps into the ark that fully covers them from the wrath of God's judgment on wickedness. Jesus is the one we're longing for. Now, you know, I, I might ask if there's any atheists in this room. There might be. I'm probably guessing there probably isn't an atheist in this room. But how many of us live like practical atheists? What I mean is, we say we believe in Jesus, but we act like there isn't a hell to come for those who don't know him. We act like we want heaven, but we try to ignore the reality that our friends and family members are going to sit in judgment and probably are going to end in hell if they don't trust in Jesus. Again, the Lord's providence put me here. We must understand above the rest of the world that God's judgment is real, that it is coming, that hell is real. And so therefore, we must plead with God for the lost in prayer. We must invite our friends to know Jesus. We must open our mouths. We must go. So this is our calling as God's people to herald righteousness as Noah did. Now, people might think that you are crazy like they thought Noah was crazy, right? They might think you're a moron. They might think you're an idiot. They might think you're a fool for heralding righteousness. And sometimes we can get so caught off I caught up in like, oh, they're going to think I'm weird, or they're going to, I'm going to stumble over my words, or ah, it's going to just cause an issue. But eternity is on the line. Eternity is on the line, like eternal life in heaven. How much do you have to hate someone not to tell them the truth? Listen, lest you think I'm preaching at you, brothers and sisters, I'm preaching at me. I had to get before the Lord on this this week and say, Lord, I am sorry. I am not, I'm not in a spot to preach this because I myself have lost people around me that I haven't shared the gospel with. It's one thing to pray for them all the time. Lord, would you please send someone? Lord, would you please send someone? Lord, would you please send someone? God, would you give me the opportunity? God, would you send me? God, would you burden me? God, would I be the one who shares the gospel? And would you save them because I went in faith and I was obedient? I'm preaching to me. Which leads me to number three. As God's people, we should worship God because he brings us safely through the judgment to come. We should worship God because he brings us safely through the judgment to come. Verses 
8, 1 through 22, the end. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. God remembered Noah. Praise the Lord for that. And God made a wind blow over the earth. His sovereignty is incredible. His power is amazing. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens were restrained and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat, and the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the seventh month of the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. And it goes through the story of how I'm sending out a, a dove to check on the, the details. And you get to verse, really, verse 14. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, Go out from the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife, and his sons and wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. Imagine. Noah stepping out of the ark and seeing the devastation all around him. Literally, he and his family, get this, are walking among the dead. Dead bodies, dead animals, and he is walking as one who has been given life. Among the dead. What does that, his heart, what does that do to his worship? What does that do to the way he feels about God? God, you judge the world, but I'm alive, I'm saved, I've been given a new God, I've been given life. This is us. We have life everlasting in Jesus Christ. We have, we are new creations, we are told. Imagine Noah's thoughts. He, his heart quickly turns to worship the one who saved him by grace. Look at verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings to the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. The seasons are now a thing. And in North Carolina, for some reason, on March 27, it could be 30 degrees outside. But it's a reminder that God will one day judge the world again. And we sit here as those who've been given grace. We remember chapter 6 verse 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Unmerited grace. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no man, no one may boast. We have been called to worship our God as those who put our faith in Jesus Christ. So how are we to make application today? Here it is. Here's the main idea. We are saved from judgment by faith in Jesus. Walk away today with this beautiful good news. If you're in Christ today, we have been saved from God's judgment by faith in Jesus. Like Noah, we now live by faith. Like Noah, we now believe God's word. Like Noah, we now live in obedience. Like Noah, we now warn others. And like Noah, we worship God. Why? Because we believe, we really believe, those who believe the gospel of Jesus Christ have gone through the flood of God's judgment on sin. And that judgment is seen nowhere better than the cross of Jesus Christ. When you look at the cross, you see, at the cross of Jesus, Jesus willingly took the place for sinners like you and like me. At the cross, 
Jesus took upon himself the weight of our sin. At the cross, Jesus bore the weight of God's judgment on sin, on our sin. And at the cross, Jesus died the death we deserve so that we could walk into new life together. And we literally, in Christ, are walking among the dead who are in their darkness, who are in sin, who will one day meet a fiery judgment if we don't give them the light of Jesus Christ. How do we see this pictured? Baptism is the greatest picture of this judgment we've gone through in Christ. Today you witness three people testify that Jesus Christ has taken their sin and washed it away. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 3, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, Peter says, which corresponds to this, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to them. See, profession of Jesus Christ as Lord is our salvation. In that moment, God saves us, and baptism is a going public of that profession. That's why Pastor Chris said, what's your sacred confession? Jesus is Lord. You are now buried in Christ in baptism, buried under God's judgment in Christ, and raised to new life. It's a picture that Christians already go through God's judgment on sin because God's judgment on sin fell at the cross of Jesus. And the question comes, do you know Jesus? Oh, listen, this is really important. The final judgment will come just like the days of the flood, like a thief in the night. Are you ready for judgment? Are you ready to stand before God and say, in Christ I lived? I didn't just profess Jesus one time back then. I possessed him my whole life. I lived for him. I didn't just say some words and pray some prayers and go to church some and, and, and try to do some good things and I didn't do that. I went all in. I was marked by the the obedience, by the character of Christ. I was baptized. I was a church member. I served my church. I lived on mission. I went all in. I guarded my eyes. I fought against the world. I condemned the world by my righteousness like Noah did. Or, yeah, I'm a Christian. Can't wait to get to heaven. There's a difference. And this silly Southern Christianity junk is nothing but garbage. Americanized Christianity is so weak and so shady. And Satan is so clever to deceive us. So the question is, are you ready for judgment? Is your life marked by the kind of character that marks God's people in the Bible? It marks Jesus Christ. See, in the second verse, or the second to last verse of the Noah's Ark song, it says... That is the end of, the end of my story, story. That is the end of, the end of my story, story. Everything is hunky-dory, dory, dory, children of the Lord. That's how how the song almost ends. Listen, everything is only hunky-dory for those who genuinely know Jesus Christ as Lord. Those who sit squarely and securely in Christ. Adrian Rogers used to say, death is just a comma to a Christian, not a period. What a great word. As Chris said earlier, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's only by putting your faith in Jesus and truly believing the gospel that we will be saved. Only then we'll be able to rise and shine and give God the glory, glory, right? Have you trusted in Jesus? Will you bow with me today?